This retrospect is about one of the pioneers of professional wrestling. Dick the Bruiser. Hit the music. Shut up and and sit sit down. down. This is Ring Talk. The only professional wrestling podcast you should be listening to. I have with me the world's most dangerous wrestler, Dick the Bruiser. In this corner, from Green Bay, Wisconsin, weighing 248 pounds, Dick the Bruiser. In a Western movie, the good guys are always good, the bad guys are always bad, and the bad guys never win. Pro wrestling is just as stylized, except that sometimes the bad guy does win, thus setting up a profitable rematch. Dick the Bruiser Apples will try to live up to his reputation against good guy Pepper Gomez. Apples has a reputation for being the number one villain in the ring. Dick the Bruiser was born in Delphi, Indiana, grew up in Lafayette, Indiana, graduating from Lafayette Jefferson High School, where he played football and wrestled. In the book, 72 Days to Football, one of his teammates, John Maximuk, highlighted in his book, Dick wasn't the greatest lineman the Packers ever had, but he was one of the most interesting characters. In college, he moved around a lot. He left Purdue after punching one of the coaches and also attended Miami, as well as lasting only two weeks at Notre Dame, also passing through Alabama before landing in the desert in Nevada Reno. He was drafted in the 16th round by the Green Bay Packers. He was an early proponent of the bodybuilding and looking odd in his football uniform with a 52 inch barrel chest and a 30 inch waist. Dick the Bruiser was 6'1", 260 pounds. Now back in the 50s and the 60s that was big. Average person's height was roughly 5'5", 5'6", possibly 5'7". So when you got somebody that's 6'1", almost 300 pounds who's built like a bodybuilder, that's a big guy. And just Purely by his size, he was a very intimidating presence. Regardless if he opened his mouth or got him to fight with people, he's a big intimidating guy. Dick made an impression when he arrived in Green Bay for his first training camp in 1951, fresh from working as a bouncer in Las Vegas. He was packing a 45 in a shoulder holster and asked to check them at the Northland Hotel front desk. Another time, Hog Hanner attempted to instigate some trouble when he told Alphys that a fellow lineman, Jerry Hullion, considered himself stronger than Dick. Dick went, smashed a beer can on his face and caused it to bleed. Started his wrestling career in Chicago in 1955 under the name Bruiser, uh, where he would be trained and also faced Vern Gagne and Luthez. From there into the late 50s, Dick the Bruiser wrestled every Thursday on television in the Detroit area. His typical opponent was pretty much a squash match where he just beat the living heck out of somebody. His only defeat on live TV was at the hands of Cowboy Bob Ellis. However, Dick the Bruiser had two rematches with Ellis at the Olympia in Detroit, and Bruiser was victorious. And you gotta keep in mind that Dick the Bruiser was a character. He was a legitimate tough guy. And if people would challenge him or get in his face, he's the first one starting to fight. He's the first one throwing a punch. That's just the way that he was. And I think everybody after a while understood that. But for for initial meeting him, people would say that he was very rough around the edges. He's a very much of a character. And in the 50s and 60s, the 70s in part of the 80s professional wrestling for all intents and purposes to people was real i remember listening to stories from my mama talking about dick the bruiser and how he was just a great wrestler and he made an impact in the state of michigan like no other there's nobody under the age of i would say 50 that doesn't know who Dick the Bruiser was. Either they saw him on TV, they saw him in real life because he would perform in Detroit all the time. Every Thursday he was on television. He made a huge impact to people in the city of Detroit for many years. And you could still go there today and ask just random people who Dick the Bruiser is and everybody pretty much knows who he is. And I think it's one of those things where it's like life imitating art art imitating life because the city of Detroit has always had a race problem. It's always been a blue collar city, always been a city of fighters. 
people that don't give up people that get crapped on you gotta wake up in three foot of snow and still make it to work to, to feed your family like back then detroit it was a very difficult living there because of the race problem because of the job problem because of the weather problem and i think because Dick DeBruiser was a little rough around the edges and people kind of embraced, not necessarily his attitude, but kind of embraced his work ethic because he was always on TV. He was always doing promotional stuff for the brand, but he was also doing nonprofit stuff. So he gained a lot of respect from a lot of people and people kind of latched on to him and he was their guy. Regardless of getting in fights and, and going over and picking fights with this football player, people embraced them people this is my guy this is somebody that i can relate to we feel that we've lost the greatest thing we ever had the world's heavyweight championship tag team belts now we're right here we're gonna get our title back we're gonna get our belts back we're gonna beat the bums that stole our belts we're gonna get anybody that's in our way we're not gonna rest until we get our championship belts back dick the bruiser and longtime business partner Wilbur Schneider purchased Indianapolis NWA promotion in 1964 from longtime owner Jim Barnett. Uh, after they purchased the Federation, they had a partnership with Vern Gagne. This agreement benefited both promotions and led to Bruiser having multiple AWA tag team champion reigns, primarily with tag team partner The Crusher, who was billed as his cousin. Dick the Bruiser was the first to christen manager Bobby Heenan with the nickname The Weasel during his run in the territory. WWA ran from 1964 until 1989 when Dick the Bruiser finally was tired of losing talent and fans are WWF. So going back to the timeline, on November 19th, 1957, Bruiser and Dr. Jerry Grams lost to Antonio Roca and world champion Eduardo Carpentier instigated a riot of estimated 500 fans at Madison Square Gardens. Two police officers were injured in an after-match altercation and several fans were arrested. State Athletic Commission canceled future events at the Garden until they came up with a feasible decision to prevent further riots. December 14, 1957, for the NWA United States Television title in Omaha, Bruiser lost by disqualification after he smashed the referee, Tom Novak. The largest crowd in four years at the City of Auditorium uh, watched the important contest. In late December 1957, Bruiser laid claim to the United States TV title on the grounds that he whipped Wilbur Schneider after Schneider beat Gagne and had him helpless when their recent match was called off due to a disqualification match. He started to feud with another Omaha villain on December 28, 1957, Don Leo Jonathan was beaten by Dick the Bruiser in two out of three falls, snatched the shoe off announcer Ed Morgan's limb and smashed Jonathan with it. The match eventually ended with a submission. After the match, Leo was pummeled by Dick the Bruiser, opening a forehead wound which would need seven stitches to close. Now with all this carnage and all this craziness, the rioting, that to promoters is money. They wanted more. So the promoters set a Texas death match to end the feud. On January 4th, 1958, Bruiser beat Jonathan in the seventh fall by submission. It was a brutal contest. He received the first Omaha title shot, Eduardo Carpentier, on January 11th at the City Auditorium. The two of three fall match with steel chair being swung by Dick the Bruiser at both the referee and the champion. He was disqualified and granted a rematch on February 1st. Carpentier beat him in their second match, setting up the final two falls to retain his title. After the match, an unidentified fan got two swings at Dick in the middle of the ring as four police officers held the fan. Dick the Bruiser won the United States heavyweight title for the first time in Chicago during January 1958 with a win over Gagne. In the final card of the indoor wrestling season in Omaha, Nebraska, Bruiser lost to Vern Gagne in an NWA US TV title match. A chair was used in the final victory for Gagne while the referee was knocked out. Bruiser and Hans Schmidt were soon the number one contenders for the NWA World Tag Team titles. On October 9, 1958, the duo stopped the report had Schmidt and Bruiser losing to claim 
to a tag team title prior to September 1958. But as the following report indicates, the duo remained champions in Omaha through the 11th of October at the earliest. The tag teams faced their toughest challenge on October 4th, 1958, when they met one of the world champions and one former champion, Vern Gagne and Eduardo Carpentier, teamed up to get the tag team titles. Bruiser pinned Carpentier in the first fall and Carpentier repaid his foes in the second. The third was not without a certain amount of controversy. Carpentier pinned Bruiser as Schmidt pinned Gagne, but the referee ruled that one of Schmidt's falls didn't count. Members of the 4,000 plus crowd rushed the ring in an attempt to get the two referees, Jerry Adams and John Lear, both longtime regional officials. Police protection was needed to assist the two referees attempting to leave the building. January 29th, 1959, Bruiser beat Tosh Togo and Aquira by disqualification after Aquira hit referee Johnny Lee. Initially, Bruiser was disqualified by Jerry Adams, stepped in and reversed Reverse the call. Members of the 3,732 crowd tossed a half dozen chairs in the middle of the ring. He regained the NWA United States Heavyweight Champion title in Detroit in May 1959 from Wilbur Schneider. During the summer, he dropped the belt back to Schneider. He beat Schneider with two out of three falls on September 18th in Denver and recaptured the U.S. title. Between January and February 1961, the U.S. title was traded back and forth between Dick the Bruiser, Bobo Brazil, Cowboy Bob Ellis, and Schneider. All four participants would every few weeks win the title and then somebody else would defeat that person and then that person win the title and somebody else come and defeat that person. I personally love it when there's a title hot potato per se. It adds drama and it adds prestige to the title. You're anxious to see who's going to win, who's going to cheat or who's going to win clean. Um, it, it heightens your attention to what's going on when the title is a hot potato. Similar situation a, le- a few years ago with Charlotte winning the title, I believe four or five times within a year, go to Sasha Banks and then it would go back to Charlotte and then Sasha and then Charlotte. It added drama and it added prestige to the title. Back then, television was sort of new. A lot of this coverage was on the radio. It added drama to whoever was listening. The person listening wanted more. They wanted to see what was going to happen next week. It was a brilliant strategy during that time for the belt to just keep going back and forth and going back and forth, and it just added drama and prestige to the belt. Bruiser again regained the U.S. title in Denver on Friday, November 17th, 1961, in front of 2,600 fans. A snowstorm was hitting the front row range at the time. Schneider used his abdominal stretch to win the first fall in 17 minutes and 59 seconds. Bruiser won the second by a count out and then the defending champion was unable to answer the bell for the final fall. He lost the U.S. title in December 1st in Detroit to Fritz von Erich. Both men went to Denver where they were forced to team for a December 8th match against the United States Tag Team Champions Art and Stan Nielsen. The team immediately self-destructed. Fritz attempted to smash Stan, but missed and hit Bruiser right upside the head. That set up for a war between the partners. Bruiser and Von Erich had a feud for many months. World heavyweight wrestling champion, United States heavyweight champion, a professional wrestler for 15 years. Dick, um, what size shirt do you wear around the neck? Well, I usually don't wear my shirts around the neck. I put them on through the armpits, and I button them. But today, my tailor's cleaning the one shirt I came to Detroit with after a fight last night. So I have to wear my butt shirt, but I wear a 21-inch collar, if that's what you're... 21-inch collar. And right. what size suit do you wear across I the I wear 56. Uh, 56. I'm not stout or port, uh, but a regular... 56 regular. Right. And how much do you weigh? 255 pounds. And how do you stay in shape? By chasing girls and drinking beer. That's a good way to, what is your, are you married? Four times. Are you married now? Four times, yeah. Yeah, what does your wife say about the way you stay in shape? Well, I don't chase girls when my wife's around. I see, that's just a little private matter. 
Well, he's not too private now, is he? <laughs> no. Bob Ellis would defeat Dick the Bruiser in Denver February 23rd, 1963. Dick the Bruiser suffered a broken blood vessel on his head, and the referee stopped the fight. He regained the U.S. title for the 13th time on March the 9th. Dick the Bruiser received a St. Louis title shot at the NWA World Heavyweight Champion against Lou Fez on March 15th at the Keel. A very large crowd of 12,727 attended. Luthez pinned Bruiser for the initial fall at 1309. Dick regained his standing in the match by taking the second at 618 by pinfall. And then Lou Spandle disqualified him in the third fall and Bruiser lost the US title. Dick the Bruiser entered into a memorable feud with NFL defensive tackle Alex Karras in Detroit. Adding to the flame burning, Dick the Bruiser went into Karras's bar in downtown Detroit and instigated a barroom fight on Tuesday, April 23rd. Promoters scheduled a Karras Bruiser match Saturday night, the 27th, at the Olympia Stadium. By the time the match happened, Karras was suspended by the NFL commissioner Pete Rosell for illegal betting. 10,000 fans appeared and witnessed a bloody affair. Bruiser pinned Karras at 1121 mark. The entire war was covered by the Associated Press. And any TV junkies, Alex Karras played for the Detroit Lions, and he also in the 80s played on a television show called Webster as the father. Tell me about that fight with Alex Karras, will you? Well, uh, you mean the one here in the bar in Detroit? Yes. Did you have another one with him? Well, uh, I did have another one with him, and I beat him at the Olympia Stadium. Well, that was a wrestling match. A wrestling match. Yeah, but I don't know about the fight you had at the at the bar. Downtown. Well, unfortunately, at the bar, I never really got a good hold of Alex Karras. Uh, I grabbed his good friend, Jimmy Butsakaris, who was the proprietor of the place, and I had him uh, down because he motioned for several would-be bouncers in the joint to put me out of the place. So I naturally knew that Jimmy Boots of Curse would be a good anchor. And I immediately put him under myself just to anchor myself. And then it seemed that the, the place uh, doesn't have, or didn't at that time have a high reputation, a good and high reputation as a clean place for a sportsman. It, they had a lot of pool sharks hanging around there. And they all proceeded to hit me on the head with their pool cues. I've got a picture uh, one of the Detroit papers took where my eye was hanging out. And one guy had a cue in my eye. and. Uh, Anyway, the police, uh, uh, as far as I know, I never did get a good suck at uh, Alex Karras. All he was trying to do was save his partner. To give you a little bit of background on the Olympia Stadium, that was where the Detroit Red Wings played for many years. That's where the production line did all the great things. Gordy Howe, Alex DeVecchio, Terry Sawchuck. So there were some great teams that came out of the Olympia. That was also the same Olympia, the great Harry Houdini performed his last show before he died. That was the show where his lungs got collapsed doing his program. So pretty interesting history with the Olympia Theater, with Dick the Bruiser, the production line, and the Detroit Red Wings, and it was also the last show for Harry Houdini. When championship wrestling at the arena at Convention Center here in Louisville has taken on uh, a fairly stable uh, Tuesday night, every Tuesday night, and uh, next Tuesday, November 30th, is no exception. You have an exceptional card. The uh, assassins will meet Moose Cholock and Dick the Bruiser. And that is an exceptional main event in itself. Also on the card, Huey Long versus Bobby Manigoff, and Bozo Browns takes on young Tom Jones from Chicago, Illinois. The big match to talk about, of course, is the main event, the Assassins versus Cholock and Bruiser, and we have the world's most dangerous wrestler with us here in the studio, an opportunity to talk just a bit with him and find out how he feels about teaming with this giant, a real gargantuan, 330-pound, the Golden Moose Cholock. And for your wrestling history fans, the Golden Cholock was one of the first names used by Andre the Giant. In the spring of 1964, after the WWA World Heavyweight Championship title match in Los Angeles, Bruiser started promoting Indiana. He opened up his own version of WWA out in Indianapolis. 
Between 1964 and 1985, Bruiser captured 10 WWA World Championships. He feuded with the likes of Baron Von Ronschke, Bruiser Brody. Bruiser returned to the AWA in 1966 and reformed his tag team with Crusher. They won their Indy AWA World Tag Team title match in May, beating Harley Race and Kurt Henning. On January 6, 1967 in Chicago, they lost the belts back to the former champs. In December 1967, they regained the titles, beating Mitsu Araku and Mr. Moto in Chicago. Between 1969 and 1975, Dick the Bruiser with Crush won four World Tag Team Championships, and he also won a World Tag Team Championship between 1973 and 1974 with Bruno San Martino. Crusher and Dick the Bruiser would lose their belts July of 1976 to Bobby Duncan, Blackjack Lanza. The Bruiser was given everything he had in the ring. He received the NWA World Title Shot from Harley Race in St. Louis January 6, 1978 before 10,500 fans. Bruiser tossed the champion over the top rope at 10 minutes to earn a disqualification. He landed an atomic drop and scored a pin at 1 minute and 41 seconds. In the second fall, race pin bruiser in the third to retain his championship. The final fall ended in 5 minutes and 21 seconds. He captured the NWA Missouri title on March 1979 in St. Louis. He regained the Missouri title in January of 1982, beating Ken Patera. He lost the belt in September to Harley Race. Dick the Bruiser retired from the sport and moved to Western Florida. Dick the Bruiser's last TV appearance happened on November 20th, 1990 during the Class of Champions 13 promoting the upcoming Starcade main event between Sting and the Black Scorpion in St. Louis, a match in which he was supposed to special guest referee. Starcade was held on Sunday, December 16th, and the Bruiser was welcomed with warm, respectful reception from his fans. He counted the winning pin on the Scorpion, who turned out to be Ric Flair. During the cage match, members of the Horsemen attacked Bruiser, but he was able to battle them off with the help of Sting. After retiring from being an on-screen performer, Dick the Bruiser was a color commentator for the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, Glow, founded by David McLean, who had previously risen through the ranks as a teenager to manage the WWA for the Bruiser. He also worked as a talent agent for World Championship Wrestling. Dick the Bruiser died November 10th, 1991 at a Suncoast hospital in Largo, Florida at the age of 62. He will forever be known for his toughness on the football field, in the wrestling ring, and an international champion. He will also be known to Metro Detroiters forever as an inspiration, as somebody that was a hero to a lot of people in the 50s and the 60s. Thank you so much for listening. Like, subscribe, share, comment. Let's talk about professional wrestling. I love the fact that I do this show and I get to combine my two favorite things, professional wrestling and history. Have a good night. Shut up and sit down. This is Ring Talk. The only professional wrestling podcast you should be listening to. Shut up and sit down.